Hello everyone, welcome back to my lectures on environmental ethics, where we look at some different philosophical perspectives about what ethical commitments we have to the environment. In other words, what is it about the environment that matters, or at least should matter to us? Last time we talked about anthropocentrism, coming from the ancient Greek word for human, which is anthropos. This is an ethical perspective according to which we should be caring about the environment because of the effect it has on humans. Natural catastrophes, loss of biodiversity, pollution, resource depletion, obviously all of those have a drastic effect on humanity. Therefore, any ethical thought that cares about humans has to prescribe great care for the environment. Today, we will look at a perspective that is animal-centered, also called zoocentric, suggesting that we should care about the environment both because of its effects on humans and other species of animals as well. But, and that's today's question, why is that? Why should humans care about anything else than humans? Today we will consider some answers to this question. One is that humans already do care. To be a bit provocative, let us ask the following. Why is it so satisfying to watch an inanimate object getting crushed, but were the same to happen to an animal, we would generally react with horror? Why don't people visit slaughterhouses and take delight in the different practices that routinely mutilate animal bodies? Why does the meat industry try to dissociate itself from all that bloody work and rather market itself with happy mascots on a spacious green field? Well, the answer seems to be that whatever our theoretical beliefs are, there seems to be a strong intuition that animals, in contrast to lifeless objects, matter. Hence, if a wildfire hits a population of animals, people will react differently than when it hits a block of empty business buildings. So, one argument in favor of zoocentrism is not that we merely should care for other animals, but that we are caring for them anyways, and so a sound ethical perspective has to explain why we care. Anthropocentrism, of course, does try to explain that intuition. Last time we talked about how the 18th century philosopher Immanuel Kant argued that cruelty towards animals is and should be condoned because it builds a cruel character, which can lead to cruelty towards other humans. In other words, animal torture is not wrong on itself, but it is wrong because it opens up the possibility that harm will come to humans. Kant was right in one thing, namely that practices such as slaughterhouse work, for example, have been linked to a variety of disorders such as PTSD and drug abuse, but also an increase in crime rates such as domestic abuse. Which begs the question, why don't we observe the same phenomenon in people that, for example, routinely crush garbage on a landfill? Shouldn't their work, since it includes similar working conditions and involves destruction, be linked to various disorders as well? As Kant already sensed but failed to truly grasp is that our relationship to animals seems to be wholly different from our relationship with that matter, which generally has absolutely no moral significance to us. It seems that whatever your perspective is, you should at least acknowledge that humans have a strong moral intuition that grants animals at least some moral significance. Of course, how we feel about animals does not imply how we should feel about animals. Hence, it has been argued that this intuition is simply an error that stems from anthropomorphism, which is a fallacy that falsely attributes human characteristics to non-human things. Following the philosophy of René Descartes, who argued that only humans have cognition and other animals are nothing but lifeless automatons or machines, scientists of the Enlightenment period tried to, to defend their often cruel and horrifying experiments on animals with the idea that any analogy between human suffering and animal squeals is fallacious. In other words, animals resist as if they were trying to avoid pain, Animals squeal as if they were in pain, but make no mistake, animals are not in pain. Only humans can feel pain because only humans have a soul or consciousness. Once Descartes' views on nature fell out of fashion, the skepticism about animal cognition remained. The thought more or less went that maybe animals are sentient, maybe not, we just don't know, and until not proven conscious, we should use them as means to our ends. 
there's several problems with this kind of skepticism, one being that it gets easily extended towards other humans. For all I know, all other humans could be what we call philosophical zombies, empty shells that behave as if they were alive, but in reality are nothing but non-conscious meat that follows the laws of causality. The only consciousness I know of is my own, so does this kind of skepticism justify acting immorally towards other people? Probably not. Some skeptics argue that other humans are more like me than other animals are, hence the jump to the conclusion that other humans are conscious has a better foundation than the jump to the conclusion that animals have consciousness as well. That idea, however, seems to exaggerate the divide between humans and other animals as if we were truly two different categories rather than related species that to a large extent share their bodily constitution. Why draw the line immediately between humans and great apes instead of mice and birds, for example, or birds and fish, or fish and insects? There seem to be many places where the proposed line between conscious and non-conscious beings seems to be far more scientifically and philosophically sound than the traditional one that tried to exclude humans from the surrounding nature. But to settle some semantics, what do we mean when we say that a being is conscious? Generally, in this debate, we mean that it is sentient, namely it can feel pleasure and pain, and it shows awareness of these feelings. It is exactly this recognition that forms the foundation of the most common sense form of zoocentrism, one that goes back to the writings of the founder of utilitarianism, who is Jeremy Bentham, who maintained that what's truly important is not whether a being thinks, but whether it feels. Hence, if we care about suffering on this planet, mainly human suffering, there's no reason to not care about other types of suffering, such as animal suffering. Therefore, we should reject practices that lead to animal suffering. Today, this view is defended by Peter Singer, who in his 1975 book Animal Liberation managed to bring the question of the moral significance of animal suffering both to the public spotlight and also revived the field of animal ethics as a legitimate and important academic topic. In his book, Singer suggests that we shouldn't treat individual beings as members of abstract groups such as species, but treat them according to their individual interests. Hence, if I torture a cat and argue that's okay because it's just a cat, I have failed to see the very real and morally important suffering that I have caused. As Singer would call it, I would be a speciesist, a neologism that is analogous to racist and sexist which means a prejudice or bias in favor of the interests of members of one's own species and against those of members of other species. At this point, it is important to know that both Bentham and Singer follow some kind of utilitarianism, an ethical position that generally maintains that action is good if it maximizes the overall goodness of all beings involved, that is, all of the beings that can feel pleasure and pain, an action that will generally increase suffering in the world is therefore bad, and one that will generally increase happiness is good. If you need a refresher on utilitarianism, feel free to check out my last video where I explain why I donated my hair. But what's important here is the observation that increasing the overall happiness could sometimes involve harming an individual or a minority. Think of the trolley problem, for example, the thought experiment that presents us with the option of saving five people if we kill one. Generally, according to utilitarianism, we should favor this option and kill the minority. The contemporary philosopher Tom Regan, however, is dissatisfied with the utilitarian framework of Singer's animal ethics. After all, it can justify all kinds of atrocities, including cutting down whole forests and killing all the animals within, if the good this action will bring to humanity outweighs the bad it has caused to animals. Rather, Reagan proposes that a zoocentric ethic had to grant some basic right to every conscious animal, such as the right to live, which makes Reagan far more radical since he basically prohibits any use of animals as a means that is not absolutely necessary. 
Hans Reagan would not allow any serious interventions into our environment because it violates the most basic rights of all the animals that inhabit it. Just like killing a human for the greater good is not permissible, he argues, so killing an animal shouldn't be. This, according to Reagan, is the real foundation for veganism. To recap, in this video we talked about moral intuitions that seem to be in accordance with zoocentrism. Furthermore, we saw the arguments according to which the membership of our species, Homo sapiens, is not a valid argument on which to base our moral considerations of an individual conscious being, but we should rather consider whether it can genuinely suffer, suffering being a thing that is worthy of real moral consideration. Furthermore, we have briefly presented two modern zoocentric perspectives, one being the utilitarianist view of Peter Singer and the other being the animal rights view of Tom Regan. Next time we will talk about biocentrism, which critiques both anthropocentrism and zoocentrism for failing to recognize that not only conscious beings matter, but that all life does. Hence, the final perspective in our series will argue that cutting down a forest is not only wrong because of the effects the environmental devastation will have on humans, and also not because of all the animals that will die in the process or lose their home. Rather, the action is wrong because it fails to respect life itself. So, how do you find zoocentrism? Do you find the arguments that I have presented convincing enough to favor it over anthropocentrism? Should and do animals matter? Because I feel that they do and should. As always, let's talk. I'm looking forward to the discussion in the comments, and until next time.